It's always a bit dangerous to clap before I've spoken. Now I feel a bit of pressure to actually produce something exciting. But uh, So my name is Tom Barry and uh, I work within the Arctic Council structure. Uh, I'm not f so sure uh, how many of you are familiar with how the council is structured, but uh, there are six working groups. Each is uh, built around a thematic basis. And actually, Iceland is the location, uh, is the largest location for the Arctic Council outside of Norway because two of its working groups have their secretariats located here. Uh, the Protection of Arctic Marine Environment and the group which I work for, CAF, the Conservation of Arctic Flora and Fauna. Uh, what CAF does within the Arctic Council structure is we sit on that policy and science divide. So we're very busy synthesizing, monitoring and integrating data across the Arctic region and trying to transform it into a manner that policymakers and bureaucrats can more easily understand. Uh, if I can change the map. Uh, I'm a geographer by trade, so I always like to show a map. And particularly when it comes to the Arctic, it tends to focus people's attention quite a lot. Uh, as you know, boundaries in the Arctic are always difficult to define. And the Arctic Council has no definition of what the Arctic is in terms of uh, geographic boundaries. But its working groups have several. And this is the... Uh, the boundary, the area within which CAF operates. So this is an enormous area, it covers about 6% of the globe. It's uh, within this huge area, the Arctic Council strives to assess, monitor, and determine what's happening with biodiversity change across the Arctic. And uh, within this whole area, last year, we produced uh, a groundbreaking work, which is the Arctic Biodiversity Assessment. So for the first time, we managed to compile uh, existing information on status and trends uh, where they were available about biodiversity across the whole circumpolar world. This is crucially important because it's the first time we've been able to take together, see the gaps in our knowledge, see emerging trends, and have a dynamic baseline where we can work to inform the Arctic Council and its member states as to the directions and policies they should uh, adopt when uh, trying to consider how best to conserve and use sustainably the resources in the Arctic. So this report, uh, as with all these reports, it took about seven years to make. I think there were over 260 scientists from across the globe who were uh, very carefully involved in this. It's divided into three sections. We have this huge doorstop report. We have a synthesis. But more importantly, we have this very small 15-page policy report. And this is the key report out of this process because in there, there are a list of 17 recommendations that were presented to the foreign ministers uh, of the Arctic Council last year and they endorsed them. Now these uh, 17 recommendations are quite broad ranging and far reaching in scope. And they're going to be key in determining how biodiversity issues are addressed in the Arctic through the Arctic Council for the coming decade. Uh, in this report as well, it's interesting, uh, it was an interesting exercise because, as you know, within the Arctic Council, the indigenous organisations have quite a high profile. They don't have, uh, they sit at the same table and, uh, as the countries, and all countries are obliged to consult with them on decisions that are made in the Council. And as a result, we try very much to find ways to incorporate indigenous perspectives and traditional knowledge in our work. Uh, and uh, we made a huge effort to try to do so through the biodiversity assessment. So it's one of those first reports where we try to grapple more concretely with that challenge. Uh, what, what we're actually doing now is that we've had these recommendations endorsed last year. Now we have to try and find concrete actions that we can take that will actually result in some measurable impact from those recommendations. So we've just drafted an eight-year action plan that's going to the Arctic Council Foreign Ministers meeting in uh, April next year. And that action plan is going to outline a range of uh, initiatives that deal with invasive species, protected areas, resilience, and a whole manner of uh, initiatives that we feel that the Arctic Council needs to address and adopt in order to effectively conserve the Arctic's biodiversity. And what I'd, while uh, we are presenting this action plan next, uh, next April, I'd like actually to refer to one early implementation action that we've taken, uh, and one that sort of maybe fits the audience here because it, it very much links the Arctic to the rest of the world. <clears throat> Within the Arctic, we're facing uh, some extreme problems with Arctic migratory species, specifically birds. Uh, and as these uh, birds spend a large part of their lifespans outside of the Arctic. We can work to conserve them as much as we want within the Arctic areas, but unless we actively engage with our partners and colleagues in Asia and South America, then those uh, conservation actions are going to be limited in effect. 
And this map here shows you uh, the one science fact I have in my presentation. <laughs> and it shows the, uh, the, the, the almost dramatic decline in uh, Arctic breeding shorebirds across the world. And you can see the greatest decline is in uh, East Asia, Australasia, where they've decreased by 90%. And you have some species, such as the spoonbill sandpiper, where there are only 140 breeding pairs left in the world, and which are rapidly nearing decline. So in response to, to the situation, and also, Building upon the increased interest by uh, uh, non-Arctic countries such as China, Singapore and Korea in the Arctic, we've launched what we call the Arctic Migratory Bird Initiative. So this is an early implementation action from the Arctic Council that's trying to adopt uh, 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 an issue of concern. And uh, there we've developed action plans for each of those flyways and they will also be presented for ministerial approval. And they demonstrate uh, the need for the Arctic Council to actively engage and benefit from the new observers to the Arctic Council. So we've had very good responses from countries such as Korea, Singapore and China in engaging and providing their scientific interest and uh, their strategic suggestions on how we can conceive of actions that will actually conserve these species that are relevant both for those in the Arctic and the rest of the world. So I think it's just a very nice example of of how what happens in the Arctic has global impacts and vice versa. Uh, within the uh, 17 recommendations that we produced, <clears throat> uh, there were three main themes. There were, of course, climate change, which is all pervasive, uh, the need to have an ecosystem-based management approach to what we do in the Arctic, but also the issue of mainstreaming. And uh, I just decided to highlight this mainstreaming issue a little bit here because I think uh, this is a very... Uh, business-orientated audience, and there's an awful lot of people here who are focused on development of resources in the Arctic. And when I say mainstreaming, what I mean is that the need to incorporate biodiversity objectives in all activities across the Arctic, both within the Arctic Council itself, but also in fishing sectors, uh, oil and gas extraction, and so on. So we're very much now trying to engage with those different sectors and try to see if we can find a common ground to develop uh, and benefit from each other's resources in the Arctic. And I'd like to plug another Congress uh, while I'm here because the Arctic Council has adopted uh, or has agreed to hold the first Arctic Biodiversity Congress and that's been held in Trondheim in December the 2nd to the 4th. So this is a cross-sectoral Congress and it's intended as a, a, a foundation or platform whereby our implementation plan for the biodiversity recommendations will be fine-tuned by the different sectors and people who will be tasked with actually implementing those actions or who we will rely upon to provide the information and the resources and the capacity to make those tasks a reality. Uh, so I would encourage anyone who hasn't uh, already decided to come to the Congress, please do so. <laughs> and it's actually proving very popular, which is a bit of a challenge, so we've gone past our capacity at the moment. <laughs> but uh, I'd like to finish now, and I'd like to put up some small facts that I took at random from uh, the biodiversity assessment which just indicate the dramatic amount of change in the Arctic. Uh, polar bears always an issue related and discussed when it comes to Arctic issues. According to the biodiversity assessment, they're, in the next 45 years their populations are going to decrease by 30%. But it's not just polar bears that we deal with, or uh, biodiversity issues within CAF, we also deal with language and linguistic diversity as a reflection of biodiversity loss. And uh, since the 1800s, something like 20, 21 languages have become extinct in the Arctic, and 10 of those have become extinct in the last 10 decades, or the last 10 years. So you can see there's a rapidly increasing rate of change in the Arctic, and an increasing rate of urgency and concern that we actually adopt the correct approaches and strategies to ensure that when we're working to uh, benefit from the services the Arctic provides, that we do so in a sustainable manner. And uh, that's why it's an interesting audience to come to here at the Arctic Circle, because it's maybe a different group of people than I normally would address and engage with, which is a good thing. So if anyone has any questions or any interest in it, knowing more about our Congress or the various different actions that we're taking in CAF, then please come and find me afterwards. And I've come under time, because they, this countdown goes into red as you start to look at it, so you feel pressure to finish. <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs>